Hello, this is a lecture 11a, part one, uh, derivatives and the shapes of graphs. My name is Scott Grizzard from the University of South Florida. Okay, so what we've been doing right now um, in class, so if you're enrolled in the class, you know that for the last two weeks, we have been doing problem sets based on the derivatives and the shapes of graphs. And if you're not enrolled in the class, I will be linking two problem sets, the one from last week and the one from this week, in the description below um, so that you can go ahead and look at these. So right now what we're going to do is kind of summarize that today. What's the big ideas from that? And then what we're going to talk about is the a way, and if you're doing the problem set in class for a problem set 11, you, you have this idea that we're doing everything separately. Um, with the various derivative tests. And that's a great idea, and it's great to do it. But we can also do things all together. So we're going to cover how to do this. Uh, we're going to talk about concavity for a minute, and then we're going to cover how to do these things all together. And then we're going to cover the second derivative test for minimums and maximums. Now, there is an additional part to this lecture. There is a part two, which is advanced forms of L'Hopital's rule. So if you're enrolled in the class, of course, you have to turn in your notes. Don't forget there are two parts to this lecture. Um, there's a, a part one and a part two, but the part two will be in a separate video because it's a separate topic. Okay. Concavity. Um, if you've been in the class, you've already messed with concavity a bunch of times. Let's do a little bit of the intuition for a moment, okay? The concavity is really the change in the change. That's the big idea. So suppose I have a function that as I move from left to right, and this idea of moving left to right, that's what we want to keep in mind here, is that the, the x kind of moves from left to right. Um, and what we have here... Um, is that the when I move this thing, when I move this thing here from left to right, what's going on here is that I'm moving, as I move to the right, the slopes are right here, they're becoming less negative, and here they're starting to become more positive. So as I move from left to right, my slopes become more positive or, you know, less negative. Um, that's kind of a concave up. That's a positive second derivative. Okay, the 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 derivative is increasing as I move from left to right. Okay. Now, why do we care? Well, think about marginal tax rates, right? The, the tax rate, you know, if you paid ten percent of your income or twelve percent of your income. In, in income taxes, you would have a constant, and that was it, right? You'd have a constant rate. This is called a flat rate, but it's not really flat, right? It's the rate is flat, not the, not the tax itself. You pay 12% of your income. So it's got a constant slope. Well, here the idea, but the income taxes don't work like that, right? They're concave up. You make you 0% you, you, of your income less than, you know, $10,000 about. Uh, for less than for now between ten thousand and forty thousand, you're going to pay twelve percent. Between forty thousand and eighty thousand, you pay twenty two percent, and so on and so on and so forth. Okay, so the marginal taxes increase as I move from left to right. So my total tax curve is concave up, and that's the idea there, right? It looks something like this, right? So I'm paying nothing, then I'm paying twelve percent. Then I'm paying 22% after that, and so on and so forth. So I've got this kind of concave up, but of course we need the, the nicer definition of concavity because we can't just use the tangent lines, we use the secant lines uh, because we've got kinks. Okay, so that's the idea of concave up. Now, one of the things we've done is, here's a problem. This is off the problem set. Um, but in the problem set, what I've set it up to do is do it separately. So what you're supposed to do on the problem set is you're supposed to find the intervals where it's increasing, where it's decreasing. You're supposed to find all the local extrema. You're supposed to find the absolute, ex the, the global extrema, um, and all of those things. And then you're supposed to do the T values and concave up and where it's concave down and all the inflection points. Well, I can do it all at once. 
in one sense. And the big thing is that we want to, the big idea is that I can only change from increasing to increasing when the concavity, when, when the first derivative is zero or doesn't exist. And I can only change my concavity where f double prime of x is zero or doesn't exist, okay? So what I can do is I can kind of use the information about the graph to kind of talk about everything that's going on. So let's look, at, let's, let's just do this real fast. Let me show you what I mean. So the first step is to find all of those interesting x values. Now, I've talked about this, I hate critical numbers, the definition. What I like is kind of interesting x values. Um, but what are my interesting x values? Well, I've got some first derivative, I've got some endpoints here. I've got some first derivative concepts, increasing, decreasing, that's a first derivative thing. Concavity is a second derivative thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of just do everything at once. Instead of doing, okay, I took the first derivative, I set it equal to zero, I find the increasing, decreasing, blah, blah, blah. And then I have a separate problem and I do the concavity. Instead of doing that, I'm going to do everything at once. So let's look at what that looks like. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a list of all my interesting x values. Instead of just doing the first and second derivative ones separate, I'm just going to do all of them and then do a big chart. Let me show you what this means like. So my interesting x values, my endpoints. Um, and then places where first derivative, these are my first derivative. Uh, so that would be my critical numbers. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with my endpoints. They are t equals 0 and t equals 6. I'm just going to write those in there. Of course, the t values, not x values, but x values is generally what we call them. All right, first derivative. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the first derivative and set it equal to 0, just like you would, except I'm not going to bother with the increasing and decreasing yet. I'm going to do the first derivative, and then I'm going to do the second derivative. Okay, so I took the first derivative and I took the second derivative. Now, I'm going to set them all equal to zero. Now that I've set them all zero, I have more interesting x values. Here I've got zero and four. And then I've got t equals two there for the second derivative one. Okay, so now I've got all my interesting x values. Next thing what I'm going to do is I'm going to find, make me a chart. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, okay, well, I've got, this is a duplicate, right? Zero is an interesting x value because it's an endpoint. It's also an interesting value because it's, you know, a first derivative. So I've got zero, two, four, and six. Now, I'm gonna have a, a side here with labels, okay? And the idea, the big idea here is I'm just doing everything at once. So, right, so when, remember this, and this was the big idea that I told you to write down if you're in class, right? If I've got, if F is, so when F prime is positive, F is increasing. When F prime is negative, F is decreasing. When F double prime is positive, that means f prime is increasing, f is concave up, and f is concave down, f prime is decreasing, and f double prime is negative. And I told you to remember this, because that's what we're going to be doing here. So I've got these intervals, right? I've got the big points, which are 0, 2, 4, and 6. And then I've got the interval, 0, 2, 2, 4, and 4, 6. So this is similar to the ones that I'm doing on the problem set or in the book, but instead of doing each one individually, right? So if, if I was doing, for example, in the book or the problem set, what I would do is I'd make this little, right? I'd make this little graph here. If I was doing the second derivative one, right? It would be two. So I would have, um, you know, uh, zero, two here. Uh, 2, 6 here, and 0 here, I'd have f, and then I'd have f double prime, this right here, oops, should be another one of these, this would be f, this would be f double prime, and then I'd have the 0 here, you can't see that, um, the 0 here, uh, I'm sorry, not at 0, at 2, this would be the 0 here, this is f double prime, 
this would be, you know, I, I compute the negative positive and all that stuff, right? Well, I don't want to, that's not what I'm going to be doing uh, here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do everything at once. So instead of doing the chart for just one item at a time, I'm doing everything at once. So let's look at it. This thing was interesting here. Which were my points where it was zero? So my first derivative is zero at zero and four. So I'm going to go ahead and put zero in for this one and zero in for that one. I'm going to put a zero here. Now, I can't actually change my concavity unless, or I, my, my concavity is going to be the same here on, on this side. I can't change my concavity because I'm not passing a zero. So once I figure out the concavity for even one of these cells, I've got it for the others until I hit the zero. Likewise, if I figure out the increasing, decreasing for one of these cells, I can't change it until I hit the zero. All right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start filling in the chart. Okay, so I've got a couple points here. If I'm looking for mins and maxes, I have to compute F of whatever I'm doing anyway. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start filling in those, those sample points. So I've got f of 0, or p of 0 in, in, in this case. So this was p. p of t was t cubed plus 6t plus 10. So p of 0 is going to be 0 plus 6 times 0 plus 10. Now I'm going to fill in a 10. Now, I'm going to do f of 4, I'm sorry, p of 4, because, let's okay, and now I'm going to do p of 4. I don't actually need to compute here whether or not I'm increasing and increasing. So before I was sitting there computing P prime of two, right? Or P prime of a sample point in between. And you can still do that, but I don't actually need to, right? If I go from 10 to 42, I'm going up. Let's do the other one here, which is six. That's the other end point. So I've got a negative 6 cubed plus a 6 times a 6 squared plus 10. Well, 6 times 6 squared is 6 cubed. Here I've got a negative 6 cubed. Well, that's convenient. Those two cancel. I don't have to do any of the big computations. And I left with 10. Now, what happened here? I went this right here. All of these, I just look at it. I don't actually compute the points. So uh, if I'm going from 10 to 42, I know I'm increasing. If I go from 42 to 10, I know I'm decreasing. All right, well, let's look at that. If I'm increasing, this right here is positive, 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 zero, negative, don't care. Now, if I'm increasing and then decreasing, I'm concave down. And I don't actually care about computing the, the rest of it, right? I know that this is going to be all negative, and then I'm actually concave down. That actually answers most of my questions, except for this stuff. I'm not sure if I'm concave up or concave down here. But I know that no matter because increasing the positive doesn't give me all the information. So here I'm going to have to do a sample point. So Step three, step four, was just to fill in what I needed without taking, right? I didn't have to do more sample points. And this is a big time saver on a test if you've got a whole bunch of things you have to do at once. It's also much more, you know, hey, all of these things are connected, right? Step five, do sample points for what's ambiguous. So I don't know what's going on here. I need to do a sample point. So I'm going to do F double prime of one. 
So 6 times 2 minus 1, I just threw in 1 here, and I wound up with a positive number. I wound up with 6. So this one I know is positive. That means right here it was concave up. Okay. I went from up to down. That means I'm going to have an inflection point right there. I've got a max here. Right. I've got a local max there. And I've got, well, I've got a local min here, but it's also a, 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 a global min. And then I'm done. I've got all of the information. I mean, I'm done with the computation. I've got all of the information the problem asked for without doing the whole chart. Well, I mean, sorry, without doing all of the sample points for each derivative. I don't need to do that because I, I just, I, 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 I've, I've, I know what the graph of this thing is going to look like. Okay. Now I can, if I've got more time and I want to verify, but this is a way, right? How many sample points did I actually have to compute? I had to do the 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 three interesting, the three zero, the three critical vector, right? The endpoints, and then the zero that was in the middle for the first derivative, right? The critical value. Um, but I didn't have to compute any of the others for p. And then instead of having to compute this here, one of these, and then one of these, and then one of these, and then one of these. The four computations that I would have had to do in addition, uh, I just look at what's happening kind of intuitively, and I go, okay, well, I only have to compute one of those. And I did. I mean, it's not a huge burden to do the whole thing. And step seven, I'm sorry, step six, I just write C chart for all my justifications, right? Because I've got it. So what's the min? What's the max? What's the inflection point? And then when I'm when I'm done, I just take my little thing and go C chart, C chart. Maybe I should get a stamp, right? C chart, C chart, C chart, C chart. Um, that's all you have to do for all your justifications. Okay, so that's how to tackle these things kind of all at once. Now, if you look at this, you're actually also going to see if I had known this was concave down, I could have found out that this was a max. So there's something called the second derivative test. And we're going to use it when we talk about optimization next time. Um, but I'm just going to say it briefly, right? If f prime of a equals zero, and then I've got f double prime of a is greater than zero, I must have a local min. Likewise, if, uh, if f prime of a equals zero and f double prime of a is less than zero, I must have had a local max. Now, if they're both zero, I've got no information. So here I've got some examples. Okay, so here I'm looking at x squared. x squared is of course concave up, but I know that because when I take f double prime of zero, I wind up with two and that's greater than zero. Okay, so my whole thing was concave up. That means I had a local min. Now, x cubed, I, I, I took the double derivative at zero, I get zero. I take the single derivative at zero, I get zero. I have no clue. And indeed, it's neither max. But the test didn't tell me that it was neither. The test just told me, I don't know. Likewise, and you can see what this I don't know means here. If I do x to the fourth, the test still fails. F double prime of zero equals zero. I don't know. But here I didn't have a min or a max, but here I did. So it only works sometimes, um, but when it works, it's a really quick way to do things. Okay, so what we talked about was uh, the derivatives and the shapes of graphs. Okay. Um, we talked about um, concavity. And what we need to do if we wanted to find the shape altogether. Again, we're doing problem sets to do the whole thing separately in class. And then we did the second derivative test. Now, a reminder that there's a part two of this lecture on L'Hopital's rule. Um, so I will see you there shortly um, when you do that. Thank you.